All right. Um, fashion studies, introduction and chapter one. Section one, uh, fashion uh, slash dress and time. Introduction. first section of the Handbook of Fashion Studies considers research on fashion and dress through the lens of various approaches to time, historical, muse- museological, new, and biographical, rather than simply focusing on the history of fashion and dress in terms of pastimes, the approach adopted for this section takes on various time-related foci. In doing so, the four chapters address respectively the following concerns, the theoretical and method- methodological methodological issues confronting the analysis of fashion and dress history uh, in the context of current theoretical shifts and the cultural flows uh, with which these are associated. (coughs) The challenges to curatorial practice in locating past fashion and dress, which was modern in its day, within the context of the Museum of Art. Uh, In contemporary culture, uh, where the essential ingredients of the wearing of clothes the, live, the lived body is absent. The potential democratization or shift from professional to lay approaches to fashion criticism and journalism made possible through the global interconnectedness of the new social media and the meteoric uh, rise of fashion blogging today. The ways in which fashion, with its ever increasing close association with youth, contributes to age ordering throughout the life course where the requirement to act your age uh, that accompanies it may increase rather than decrease the invisibility and denigration of older or different bodies. Lou Taylor is a renowned dress historian and curator whose approach to dress history, as she readily acknowledged uh, in Chapter 1, has been grounded in close assessment of the actualities of garments themselves, For Taylor, it is from the garments that the histories emerge. Uh, However, she is aware that the object-based approach she advocates is not shared by a number of academics whose interest, like hers, is in fashion and dress. In this first chapter, Fashion and Dress History, Taylor's wide-ranging discussion sets out and assesses the mushrooming of academic interest in fashion from a range of disciplines, which in turn has generated new (laughs) methodologies over the past 15 years or so. The chapter begins with a discussion of what she called the old great divide between academic fashion curatorial research and fashion history research, which remained resolutely separate from each other. To a large extent, as Taylor notes, this divide has begun to fray at the edges with students and researchers moving toward a position of recognising value in other approaches. The newest kid on the block, as Taylor notes, is fashion studies, and as she indicates, distinctions between fashion studies and fashion dress history are not clear-cut, and definitions may vary from one academic to another. Defining terms such as fashion dress, clothes, costume, and so on, have been a key topic for specialists in different areas for a number of years, as Entwistle has also noted. Entwistle points out that the terminology used is generally related to the particular field of study that a scholar is rooted in. So, for example, sociologists whose area of study is their own culture tend to focus on fashion, uh, seen as a feature of modernity, which is characterised by its rapidly shifting industrial, social and economic configuration. Taylor sets out the major developments in recent research and critical theory, and uh, beginning with an examination of the material culture approach to clothing and dress, uh, uh, which, which then broadens out to encompass approaches to, for example, social and economic history, dress and ethnography. Uses of literature in dress history, oral history and oral testimony are as a source for dress history and fashion studies, uh, so forth. Taylor acknowledges the contribution that the burgeoning area of fashion studies has, uh, fashion studies and the crisscrossing of disciplines has made to the field. 
including the loosening of the old Great Divide and the generation of international research developments not restricted to the West. Nonetheless, she remains attached to the importance of touching, looking, listening, and reflecting, uh, which entails taking time to research, reflect on, and then interpret uh, objects of clothing in their specific and yet interdisciplinary historical gendered class or ethnic context. While Taylor does engage with curatorial practice and policies briefly, in Chapter 2, Dress, Time and Space, Don't Air, Barbieri and Crawley consider the ways that the perception, interpretation and representation of time have acquired new significance. In a number of contemporary exhibitions of historical dress, they argue that by drawing on postmodernist frames of reference on tempor temporality, memory uh, and narrative, uh, that uh, there have been significant curatorial attempts, uh, curatorial attempts to play with temporal, tempor, bleh, temporality, spatiality, materiality, and performativity to rupture uh, the dominant perception of historical dress as being fixed or locked in times past. The curated and conserved dress <coughs> as museum object uh, references the absent body, which at the same time is brought into play by what the authors term the curatorial intervention. Here the authors drew on Austen's notion of the performative in language, which he suggests is a doing rather than by simply describing something. Uh, for example, in voicing the words, I name this ship Queen Elizabeth, or saying, I do, in a wedding ceremony, we are not simply making a statement. According to Austen, rather we are doing something, we are performing an action. Uh, from this viewpoint, words act and enact what they name, following along these lines. Barbie Airy and Crawley are concerned to reveal the doing in exhibition making's imaginative process. They draw on Wilson's notion of the uncanny experience of looking at items of clothing in museums that once adored a body that is no longer there but is invoked by the presentation of dress. They consider that the something only half understood. Uh, they consider that there's something only half understood has been an issue for contemporary curators of dress. And the chapter sets out to examine how this challenge has been met by particular contemporary exhibition makers. The authors first explain the ways in which Warhol's, that is Andy Warhol, curation of uh, objects from the costume, the costume collection for the Museum of Art of the Rhode Island School of Design in 1969, challenged conventional hierarchical <laughs> approaches to displaying objects and itemizing them in the catalogue accordingly. Rather, Warhol insisted that all the shoes in the collection, together with parasols, uh, together with parasols as costume accessories, were displayed in a cabinet the visitors could open and close, opening up possibilities for audience engagement and participation. Warhol's radical experimental approach was highly influential and led to other experiments in the presentation of missing objects, including dress. Bob Barbieri and Crawley discussed the impact of later exhibitions that were influenced by this approach, looking at, for example, other curatorial interventions by Wallen, Wilcox and Clark that have had an impact on the field. The authors show how, for example, Wilcox and Clark were searching for a new experimental way to exhibit historical dress within the museum context, which drew on other artists and curators who were not involved in the dress duration. Clark's Malign Muses, When Fashion Turns Back Exhibition for Momu Museum in 2004, uh, uh, which was retitled Spectres, When Fashion Turns Back, uh, when the exhibition transferred to the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2005, was viewed by Valerie, was viewed by Steele as paradigm shifting. Barbieri and Crawley show how Clark drew on uh, experimental methods of display uh, based on a dialogue between dress, space, and ideas that privileged a conceptual approach uh, that employed performative strategies rather than the more conventional instructive approach. Uh, to, dress <laughs> to dress display uh, that is rooted in a chronological timeline. In doing so, the authors argue that curators like Wilcox and Clark in particular deepen uh, the complex relationship between dress and culture. In Chapter 3, uh, 
Rockamora takes the discussion away from fashion and dress history to address new fashion times, as her chapter is titled. In this chapter, Rockamora argues that where fashion time was once neatly paced by the biannual collections, by the spring-summer takeover of the autumn-winter uh, collections, and by the monthly publications of glossies, uh, um, now fashion time has accelerated and fragmented into a series of moments that have shattered its orderly pace. <sighs> yes. um, yeah, she points to the fact that pre-collection Pre-fall, cruise and resort collections are all new moments in this restructured fashion time. A, t- a time ruled by the imperative of immediacy, Tomlinson has identified as constitutive of today's culture of speed. The recent creation and rapidly proliferation, rapid proliferation of new digital media, such as uh, fashion blogs, has supported and been supported by this culture of immediacy. Based on an analysis on an on an analysis of the development of digital fashion media, Rockamora interrogates the notion of time, uh, drawing on a variety of theoretical approaches from uh, Karl Marx, uh, Deleuze, and Guattari uh, to situate the shifts in modernity from old to new times. The chapter begins by contextualising the development of fashion within the context of <coughs> the rise of modernity, uh, which was characterised by industrialization and the associated values of progress, rationality and rapid change. As modernity went full speed ahead in the 19th century with the expansion of new communication systems such as the railway and the need to synchronise uh, mass labour force uh, time, as Rukamura shows, became <coughs> uh, perceived as a scarce resource <laughs> and a central dimension of capitalism, which gave rise to important theoretical analyses of the consequences of its formation. As the speed of change accelerated into the late 20th century, theorists began to speak of a speak of an information society. Uh, so that is a society that is no longer founded on the production of goods and materials, but rather on the creation and circulation of information due to the rapid expansion of new information uh, tech. Modernity's uh, former strict adherence to clock time has given way to timeless time in a society that is constantly networked uh, via uh, new tech such as the internet and the mobile phone, uh, it, it is in the sense that time and space are compressed into one, characterised by a culture of speed. Rockamora discusses the acceleration of the speed of time in relation to fashion and the recent developments in fast fashion, uh, where new or emergent fashion trends and styles are copied and made up for purchase in retail outlets as soon as they have appeared on the catwalk, challenging the exclusivity of the uh, haute couture model of fashion, Rockamora cities, among others, the global high street retail company Zara, uh, which produces 30,000 different designs a year, as a leader in the fast fashion trend of providing almost instant access to new fashion styles. Uh, she notes that the speeding up of fashion has been accompanied by an increasingly rapid flow of immaterial fashion in the guise of fashion websites, uh, which have become uh, key platforms for the circulation of fashion discourse. Uh, Rockamora points to the trajectory of the first fashion website, uh, websites, uh, which began to appear from the mid-90s, uh, such as UK Vogue, followed by others like WGSN, Netta Porter, and Show Studio, to mention but a few. Uh, however, she sees that a key moment in the history of digital fashion came into being in the early 21st century uh, with the introduction of fashion blogs which were first created by non-professional independent individuals and were subsequently taken <coughs> taken up by different uh, fashion organisations as a means of further disseminating their visions and values to a potentially global audience contributing to the acceleration of fashion. Rockamore argues that the increasing, increasing rapidity of material and symbolic fashion have supported what has become a... What, has become a defining trait of contemporary society, acceleration, and a collapsing of time and space. 
In Chapter 4, uh, Twig addresses yet another notion of time through a consideration of the relationship between fashion, the body, and age. Twig's discussion... Twig's discussion that its starting point from the idea that clothes lie at the interface between the body and its social presentation. And following Entwistle, she considers that dress should be understood as a situated body practice. Uh, there are cultural norms associated with dressing, and one of these norms is in relation to age, uh, the central topic of her chapter. Uh, here the author carefully uh, addresses the ways in which fashion and dress relate to notions of age and aging in contemporary Western culture. The popular images of age in contemporary pop, pop culture are uh, shored up by the dominant biomedical master narrative, uh, uh, tend to categorize age as a consequence of physiology <coughs> as something rooted in the processes of bodily decline. Twig argues that aging needs to be considered as a social and cultural construct, as research on aging has clearly demonstrated that many of the key features of later life are determined as much by social and uh, physiological processes. <laughs> she mobilizes current themes of embodiment to explore the intersections between forms of dress and changes in the body as people age in the context of the cultural assumptions that attach to these. The discussion of the issues surrounding age and dress is predominantly centred on women. The author locates the shifts in perceptions uh, of ageing historically, uh, noting that in Western cultures, uh, the entry into what is called old age has been largely, largely defined in terms of retirement. Uh, although it is important <laughs> to note that what counts as old may vary from culture to culture and within cultural context. The analysis demonstrates uh, that the boundaries of what counts as old in contemporary Western culture are not as rigid as they were before, which is highlighted by the oft-heralded slogan in the media that 60 is the new 40, or what Twig calls moving younger. The triumph of youth culture and the growth of consumer culture that uh, accompanied the 1960s revolution is often considered to have contributed to a more relaxed or perhaps less moralistic approach to uh, notions of what form of dress is appropriate uh, for individuals at different stages of their life course. Uh, by drawing on the presentation of fashion uh, and age in the fashion industry, the media, uh, fashion magazines and a UK project on clothing and age funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. The chapter considers the subtle ways that dress plays a key role in age ordering, uh, which contemporary culture, within contemporary culture. <clears throat> uh, this, it might be argued, contributes further to the, to the tech of the technologies of the aging bodily self, uh, as opposed to a freedom from uh, previous social constraints and negative conceptions of older people. Um, the social enhancement to be gained from looking 10 years younger, as Twig notes, has its limits. <laughs> Wearing clothes designed for a much younger market in order to look younger can point up, can point up the ageing body. Moreover, moving younger has become a central cultural ideal, which, in part, which is part and parcel of what uh, Higgs and colleagues call the will to health in later life. <clears throat> the author concludes... Uh, that fashion studies have, have largely ignored age. Just as studies of age have paid scant attention to the areas of consumption, performance and identity, Twig indicates that recent developments in the, in the field have sought to attend to, to this gap. As such, this chapter may be seen to form a bridge between this, this section of time and the following one, which focuses on identity and difference. Okay. So chapter one, fashion and dress history, theoretical and methodol method 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 <laughs> methodological approaches. There we go. Introduction. This chapter discusses discusses approaches to and developments in researching and theorizing dress and fashion history. After a lifetime involved in this field, it would seem straightforward enough to write such an introductory chapter in a scholarly handbook. After one has been a fashion design student in the early 60s, worked as a museum dress curator from the mid-60s 
to the early 80s and taught dress history in art schools, polytechs and unis for a lifetime, such a task would seem unproblematic. Yet, this has proved far from easy because over the last 15 years, our field has broken into banks and flooded into a fertile plane of new approaches and method- methodologies. Each of these is, an, is, an exciting and valid, is as is exciting and valid as the others, and each uh, has developed its own methodolo- methodology <laughs> and specific interests. Now, as well as the old base of art and social history, we have academic text about clothing from specialisms of design history, uh, ethnography, gender, feminist, film and photography studies, and media studies, as well as business and economic history. Performance studies, uh, geography, uh, uh, urban studies, colonial and post-colonial studies, uh, literature studies, and on it goes. Where one outcome of all this has been a clear escalation of interdisciplinary research, a theme that will run through this chapter. No one can possibly be skilled in every one of these academic fields, each of which has its own set of specific critical approaches, interests, and standpoints. So where does this leave the bewildered incoming students? What what critical stances does the drowning researcher have to leave? Rather, uh, what critical stances does the drowning researcher leave in without over-confusing the story? And what can she, he, leave out without compromising it? Uh, The central interest of my own dress history research has always been based around close assessment of the actualities of garments themselves, from the stories they offer us and from the critical possibilities uh, inherent within those stories. While it is a fact that many scholars are now working from clothing things, many more are not and will not do so. Fundamental questions recently asked by colleagues uh, seemingly unconvinced by this approach have included why do you need to look at clothes in a museum or how do you how can you how <laughs> how you can tell anything just by looking how can you tell it yeah. these questions have reminded me that object based material culture analysis undertaken through examination uh of surviving uh, clothing has yet to convince a few, a good few academics uh, who nevertheless share this driving interest in dress, fashion, clothes, costume. Uh, but approach these from quite different standing points, starting points. This chapter therefore seeks to outline current developments in the fields of dress and fashion history, which sit alongside and are intertwined with those rooted in the field of fashion studies today. The conclusion will point to uh, possible future developments in this area of study, old divides and ancient antagonisms. (sighs) Today, new generations of students looking for their ideal undergrad or postgrad course are confronted by a range of terms and consequential confusions. Uh, They can study in a plethora of programs in fashion dress history and fashion studies from the bachelor's the doctoral. Students are surprised to find out that this is a comparatively recent state of affairs, uh, achieved not without struggle. I have named the old divides between the uni museum curatorial research and the wider fashion history world as a great divide. In uh, in 2009, Hart, from his from his viewpoint as an economic <laughs> economic textile historian. Um, and a key player in professionalising dress history studies within the uni- university system, summed up the, the, the old situation perfectly. Uh, thus, so um, historians were defeated by clothes. Archaeologists fussed about the surviving evidences of their absence. Art historians were interested only in the, port- the portrayed upper classes. Uh, social historians were torn between thinking clothes were either too trivial to bother with or too complex to master, and economic historians could not count them and therefore paid no attention. Clothes were dismissed from academic history. Archaeology, art history, social history, economic history, all flourished as indeed it did history. Uh, Academic conferences and departments and degrees and debates, all booming, but clothes were left to art colleges plus a few enthusiastic eccentrics. Uh, 
As Hart notes, such a view has now been eroded by the weight of the new first-rate interdisciplinary research and publications. Miller, a social anthropologist, has dealt with ancient antagonisms of his own, those between students of textile conservation, design, or museum collections, set against students with backgrounds in cultural studies, sociology, or social anthropology, uh, with training in semiotics and symbolic analysis, and an interest in the social life of clothing. He explains, specialists in textiles may have very little respect for those disciplines they lump together as cultural studies. In turn, social, science, social scientists may denigrate scholars of textile, pattern, form, and tech as positivists who study such things merely because they have collections. They see such attention to detail as emulating the assumptions of objectivity in the natural sciences and thus as a kind of right-wing failure properly to appreciate the politicised nature of all such research which they have been trained to elicit uh, from the material as what really matters. While it would be foolish to believe that all of this tension has dissolved, I have watched with much interest as this great divide begins to disintegrate. Now, researchers from various various of fields of study uh, have realised the fascinating potential of the history and uh, pres and present of the design, making, retailing, and consumption of clothing, and now accept that. As Roach has clarified astutely, the history of clothing tells us much about civilization. It reveals their code. Specialist academic journals that regularly feature interdisciplinary text on dress fashion and new such approaches include costume, cloth and culture, textile history, uh, winter the, the winter the portfolio, the journal of design and studies in the decorative arts, the material culture journal, and more. Established and new fields of study. Today there is an additional new stream flooding into the market area, fashion studies. Notions of what the differences between fashion studies and fashion dress history actually are have become a further crisscross of confusion for students and early researchers alike. Definitions are far from clear, differing from one uni to the other and one scholar to another. Some fashion studies programs and texts may build on a foundation of critical dress fashion theory and social history, uh, while many barely contain elements of historical study at all. Others are based on analysis of today's global fashion industry. Undergraduate and master's programs <coughs> in fashion dress history and fashion studies uh, that include historical and critical approaches can be found in universities in Australia, uh, the US, Britain, Denmark, Sweden, Canada, and France, uh, for example. Uh, most fashion studies courses lay critical emphasis on analysis of 20th and 21st century fashion studies, while dress and fashion history programs are normally rooted in a far wider time span. Both would normally include high levels of critical theory. Uh, Granata suggests that arguments could be made for fashion studies to develop as a self-standing discipline with its own mythology and departmental structures, or for it to remain a subject to be studied across a range of disciplines from visual culture to sociology. Fashion studies departments indeed are currently based across departments of art and design history and theory or allied to programs in visual culture, uh, media studies, film studies, gender studies, history, uh, marketing and performance studies, business studies, fashion design and home economics. A survey of websites reveals many commonalities, particularly interdisciplinarity. To give a few examples, the uh, University of Stockholm uh, MA in Fashion Studies, based in its Faculty of Humanities, addresses questions concerning fashion as a discourse and the construction of identity with regard to fashion as an industry. The program also investigates fashion as an aesthetic and material form, 
including representations of fashion in the visual arts, photography, theatre, film, advertising and marketing. Uh, uh, the webpage for the MA in Fashion Studies at Parsons New School, New York, based in their School of Art and Design History and Theory, stated in 2012, using an interdisciplinary approach, students explore fashion as uh, object, image, text, practice, uh, uh, theory and concept and develop a critical understanding of fashion and its complex global intersections with identities, his histories, and cultures in this contemporary world. <clears throat> the University of Brighton's webpage for its BA in Fashion and Dress History highlights that it emphasises history and consumption more than many other programs and assesses the ways in which different social, national, ethnic, and gender groups project their identities through their dress. The webpage for the BA in Fashion History and Theory at Central St. Martins also stresses its inter interdisciplinarity, considering the design, manufacture, promotion, and consumption of fashion, and their relation to and their relation to relevant social, historical, and cultural contexts. The webpage on the MA in History of Dress at the Courtauld uh, Institute of Art. Uh, stresses first that art historical mythologies provide the starting point, but then similarly highlights the program's emphasis on design, manufacture, uh, promotion, and consumption of fashion within yeah, dot, 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 within social, historical, and cultural context. The webpage of the London College of Fashion MA in Fashion Curation notes its stress on specialist practice-based uh, critical and interpretive, interpretative skills involved within the discipline of fashion curation. Now, undergraduates can study fashion in the University Department of Big History at the University of Warwick. The description of its course, Fashion and History, A Global Look, uh, notes, why was fashion so important in the life of millions of people, at least since the Middle Ages? What is the relationship between economic change social and cultural transformation and fashion. Uh, that there is much overlap across all these courses is evident. And now that we are fun uh, functioning in this world of interdisciplinary developments, maintaining real or imagined differences seems futile. What remains is to further enhance the, the depth and breadth of our field of study by embracing this interdisciplinarity. Definition of terms. Attempts at defining terms, dress, fashion, clothing, and costume have exercised specialists in the field for many years. Uh, Hart has commented that such definitions crucially affect not just the approach to a topic, but to a whole sub-discipline. Are uh, we doing the history of dress, of clothing, of costume, or of fashion? For each of these, four words contain intrinsic indicators of different approaches, and each of them can be used to describe the field itself. In her survey of the historiography of dress fashion, uh, history terminology, uh, Gundy's preference was to use the term dress as defined in Barnes and uh, Aisha's Dress and Gender, uh, 1992. They proposed a socio-cultural approach, comprehensive, uh, cross-cultural, and uh, grounded in ethnography. <clears throat> Roach's preference is for the term clothes, rather than costume. Uh, let us speak of clothes as the best word suited to a social and cultural history of appearances. He defines the term costume, a word of Italian origin, as too ambiguous in its double meaning of custom or a way of dress. Bazerman, Aisha and Sid Cerny share this view and comment that, to some, the term costume contains an inherent bias that differentiates the unfamiliar for, from the familiar. In English usage, the term costume often refers to exceptional dress, dress outside the context of everyday life, Halloween costume, masquerade costume, theatre costume. Tarlow agrees, noting that the term costume is more associated with history and theatre than everyday living. There is none. Also further 
There is now also further recognition that applying the term fashion only to Euro-American and global styles betrays a strong sense of culturally dominating Eurocentricity that is no longer acceptable. Uh, Weizmann, Aischer and Senri make it clear in 1993 that such privileged positions reflected the uh, predilections of a society that has given precedence to the status and lifestyle of the middle and upper class. Euro-American, which far less con- with far less concern shown for dress from the rest of the world. <clears throat> they propose, therefore, nesting the study of Euro-American dress uh, conceptually within the broader topic of world dress. Uh, such a focus recognises that the people of the world interact, uh, have interacted and will continue to interact uh, with concomitant changes in dress. They point to Rosaldo's stress on cultural interconnections around the world. Rosaldo commented in 89 that in in the present post-colonial world, the notion of an authentic culture as an autonomous, internally coherent universe no longer seems tenable, except perhaps as a useful fiction or a revealing distortion. He stresses that rapidly increasing global interdependence has made it more and more clear that neither we nor they are as neatly bounded as homogenous and homogenous as once seemed to be the case. Finally, he suggested significantly uh, that in examining colonial or post-colonial themes of cross-cultural consumption, we need to be aware that all of us inhabit an interdependent late 20th century world marked by the borrowing and lending across porous national and cultural boundaries that are saturated with inequality, power, and dominion. Uh, Such fashion and textile bleedings across porous boundaries have been dated back to the 14th century, uh, when printed cottons were already specifically produced in India for the Egyptian market. Recent innovative research into cotton shints Uh, History has exposed similar manufacturing, trade, and fashion interdependencies across the poorest cultural, political, and economic boundaries between India and Europe. And significantly, back again, from the late 16th century through to the 19th century. Uh, Wren researched the introduction of specifically designed cotton prints by the Holt Company of Liverpool into the Yoruba Kaba Bunu district of Koji state in central Nigeria in the, in the 1930s, uh, noting that this roll, roller-printed cloth was admired not only because it was light in weight and easy to wash air, but also because locally it represented notions of modern civilised behaviour. Uh, uh, so, we are all aware now that notions of modernity and fashionability are embedded into evolving dress practices uh, the world over. And research has gone from strength to strength. Uh, Pirani and Wolf, for example, have shown us the centrality of fashion on Yoruba terms with the design of Asso OK strip weave fabrics in Nigeria, uh, for example. They note that as well <coughs> as being the preferred Yoruba choice of wealthy urbanites as visible symbols of prosperity, status, and pride in ethnic heritage, uh, the cloth is both costly and fashionable. They highlighted the role of the skilled craft hand weavers and traders who have their fingers on the pulse of fashion uh, through ongoing interaction with their elite uh, consumer patrons. Okay. Asso OK has thus become a powerful symbol of Yoruba modernity that pays no allegiance whatsoever to Western fashion roots. Thus, today, dress history and fashion studies are now subject areas that embrace the study of dress <coughs> and <coughs> textile from all over the world with equal respect, uh, seeking an equal understanding of the specific forms of tradition, modernity, and fashion. All the writers and researchers noted here are absorbed by the use of clothing dress fashion as a vehicle 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 for all manners of historical and contemporary culture, cultural and social history analysis. Uh, the most marginalized 
a field of all was government reenactment work, but that too, at its best, has become increasingly respected as a lively teaching aid at heritage heritage sites and museums. The old divides <coughs> have collapsed so far that museums such as the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Design Museum in Copenhagen, for example, employ their own academic research staff to help develop exhibitions and some dress curators around the world and now also university lecturers. Now museums and universities apply for funding grants as a norm. <coughs> Key developments in research approaches and critical theory, material culture approaches to the study of clothing. One of the factors in these positive key developments has been the embracing of material culture approaches and the now widely held acceptance that probing objects, including clothing, can pull out stories, accessible by no other methods. As Roach has clarified astutely, clothing is a good indication of the material culture of society for it introduces us immediately to consumers. <coughs> Uh, patterns and enables us to consider the social hierarchy of appearances. Uh, while Roach did not examine surviving garments and textiles, the anthropologist Miller, writing over 20 years later, understands the cultural significances built into every into the very materiality of garments and appearances. We are prepared now to see clothes themselves as having agency, as part of what constitutes and forms lives. <coughs> cosmologies, reasons, causes, and effect. <coughs> uh, Miller firmly believes that material culture studies, as the, they pertain to textiles and clothing, lead to a new respect for scholarship that considers draping, feel, comfort, and assemblage, and that patterns of value are created, not just patterns of style. <coughs> <clears throat> Ostlander argues, too, that people's relation to language is not the same as their relation to things, uh, all that they express through their creation and use of material objects is, furthermore, not reducible to words. Pierce follows up the same theme, writing, objects hang before the eyes of the imagination, continuously representing ourselves to ourselves and telling the stories of our lives in ways which would be impossible otherwise. Uh, material culture approaches to the study of dress thus focus on its design, manufacture, retailing, <coughs> and consumption, and on the end life of objects of clothing. In order to find, in order, finally, to speculate on themes such as past and present social hierarchies, histories of making, manufacturing, and trading, and the cultural gendered meanings of specific garments to wearers. Uh, to communities uh, and indeed to nations, past and present. The requirement, however, is to set these exactly in the context of their own period, geographical uh, and cultural consumption spaces. This approach places sharp focus on the materiality of surviving items of dress, <clears throat> where one key to success is to pay attention to the trivial details, such as fabric, sewing, trimmings, and accessories, a viewpoint often derided in the past by social and economic historians, who took no interest in the actuality of garments, failing to understand the nuanced cultural importances embedded in supposedly trivial details. Beatrix Lawitta, uh, examining the material culture of young Parisian bourgeois women in the 80s, in the context of ideas by Braudel, Bordeaux, and Levi Strauss, noted that she deliberately termed the trivia of their clothing, the cut of jeans, uh, the similar engagement rings, and silk scarves. Because when these are added together, they create a distinction, which enables a man to mark out a sphere for himself in which he will live with himself and his fellows. Such trivia can be located by sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, as well as by text and image. <coughs> Oslander stresses that each provide certain kinds of information and people create unique and non-interchangeable -inter forms in each of these sensorial domains. 
a symphony cannot be rendered visually. The aroma of roasting coffee cannot put, be put into words. Uh, the feeling of cashmere or burlap cannot be expressed in music. In a particular domain <coughs> of concern here, natural culture, sight, and touch are the relevant senses. Uh, and um, objects and words and images of the relevant genre. O'Connor is also convinced that close study of objects is needed and that the ubiquity, intimacy, and materiality of cloth and clothing mean that by studying them, we can obtain nuanced insights into the dynamism of society on many levels, not easily arrived at by other means. If at all. Uh, LaHaye, Lou Taylor, and Thompson um, researching a collection of the surviving dress on the Messel women from the 1860s on, noted that the clothes are far more than elegant fashion items. They live on as material fragments through which it is possible to trace the biographies of six generations of women from this exceptional family. Uh, through examination of um, hundreds of surviving dresses and accessories, they were able to highlight for the first time a specific methyl feminine fashion taste, a luxurious but slightly arty historical English style that developed across four generations of wealthy Messel women from the 1860s. It was a subtle style designed to project a non-worldly elegance uh, based on historical family heritage, uh, though that in truth was of dubious reality. For example, uh, shows the front panel of the London Couture evening gown made from Maud Marcel by uh, Fullerton, uh, a young in deep purple velvet dating back from 1907. This one was personalised highly unusually through the addition of an embroidered section cut from a late 18th century man's waistcoat, almost certainly from Maud's own textile collection. <coughs> the authors concluded, uh, we have sought to demonstrate that the application of a close garment focused study of surviving clothes can help us touch the memories, emotions, aspirations, and sensitivities uh, of their owners, characteristics which drive the world along and yet which are so often left out of historical study and museum interpretations. Such approaches are now widely accepted. Auslander, among many others, is convinced uh, that objects act as memory cues or expression of the psyche uh, or extensions of the body, as well as sites of aesthetic investment involving ple pleasures, distress, or conscience, conscious indifference. Yeah. And then there's just a image here of um, of the of an evening gown. Uh, that was mentioned. Uh, yeah. Social and economic history. Over the last 20 years, uh, social and economic historians, uh, too, have come to accept the historical and cultural significances <coughs> to be drawn uh, from what Andrew, Andrew S. Uh, terms the lived experience of dress. The pioneer in this approach was Roach, uh, with his seminal book, uh, books, the People of Paris, an essay in popular culture in the 18th century, and the culture of clothing, dress, and fashion in the ancient regime. He uh, was clear that assembling, assessing, rather, historical uh, clothing is another way of penetrating the heart of social history. Both his text extensively used clothing uh, sources unearthed from 18th century inventories, wills, uh, uh, notarial uh, documents, uh, court reports, and police witness and mor morator morator eh, mortuary reports. Uh, Roach examined dress from the nobility to the poor in pre-revolutionary Paris, par <coughs> Paris, choosing not to access surviving clothes of the rich. Few clothes of the poor have survived. He uh, produced a masterly account of the clothing of the citizens of Paris. Nevertheless, to give just one example, using uh, notary listings to shop clothing belonging to the 
Parisian uh, food pair, uh, which are dealers selling new and second-hand garments, he was able to demonstrate that two-thirds of the colours chosen across Parisian society in 1789 at the dawn of the French Revolution were drab, black, brown, maroon and grey, and usually plain. His, his, uh, his final question noted that pre-revolutionary hi- hierarchical uh, difference in dress in Paris uh, was one of the visible manifestations of the coherence of the old world. He asked whether during the revolution its, its function changed into a more egalitarian stance. Did it, in its social specificity, by its nature, unite the instinct for equalization within the distinctive hierarchies and the appeal of egalitarian imitation? Roach's pioneering studies paved the way for today's interdisciplinary material, culture, social, and economic history approaches, uh, styles, and a vicary of approaching material culture study from just such roots have, us- have usually uh, discussed the interdisciplinary problems of twinning text with artifact based research. Some have treated material evidence as an adjunct to text based history, others have argued for the superiority of the material over textual evidence. For studying the illiterate majorities that characterized most historical societies, others again have made a case for according empirical precedent precedence to material evidence over textual evidence. But all those who share a material culture framework share a commitment to thinking about the social and cultural work performed by artifacts. Even without surviving examples of their fabrics and clothes, these approaches take us close to understanding social differences personal memories, aspirations, and even the life regrets of consumers. Vickery identified the moderate character of uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Shackleton. For example, through her care for her clothing, she was the financially secure window of a textile merchant living on the edges of merchant and gentry class circles in the West Midlands. Through Mrs. Shackleton's diaries, domestic account, books, from 1762 to 1781, and local regional archives, even without a surviving whole garment, Vickery identified Mrs. Shackleton's reuse of a much-loved fabric. Uh, Once her favourite pretty red and white linen gown, (laughs) um, in 1773 she used one scrap to make a working bag. Okay. Um, uh, Vickery notes too, that wherever possible, outdated or faded gowns were often unpicked to the original fabric lengths and that Mrs. Shackleton sent these to be dyed in Manchester or London. Vickery interpreted all of this as a rebuttal of the stereotypic view of women as spendthrift consumers of frivolous fashion and thus she similarly challenged historical historical prejudices against women characterized as parasitic and pointless consumers. Stiles makes clear his approach uh, to the use of dress in his well-received the, the Dress of the People, Everyday Fashion in 18th Century England. In analyzing plebeian fashion, uh, the Dress of the People has focused on how it was embedded in the practices of everyday life, not on issues of meaning and identity, which have so often engaged those who study dress. Emphasis is on (coughs) distinction between best and working clothes. Through this style of questions, previous assumptions about the low consumption levels uh, of even stylish clothing among working people uh, in England in the 18th century. He accessed sources similar to those used by Roach, but additionally used more illustrations including samples of period fabrics uh, to illustrate the significance of his emphasis on the existence of uh, best as well as everyday garments within the dress of the people. Dress and ethnography. Ethnographic approaches to the study of dress examine the lives of world communities, assessing homes, religious practice, social organisation, land ownership, agricultural and consumption systems, gender relationships and domestic and clothing artefacts. 
Today, these methods are applied equally to, rem to remote or urban settings, as Lewitta has shown. All now propose a view of living cultures assessed through the eyes of the community who made and wore the clothing. No longer are they examined from colonial and imperial viewpoints. Researchers today, as already noted, are probing issues of cross-cultural design and consumption. And no country is seen as isolated from the global ebb and flow of human exchange and contact. Uh, Riello and Roy note that, just for one example, that as early as the 14th century, West Africa uh, exchanged primary products for Asian manufactured goods, such as cottons and other fine textiles, and that considerable quantities of Asian textiles also arrived in Congo as luxury, luxury clothes designed in rich and colourful ways. Portraiture is a source of dress history studies. Uh, Rand comments on the inevitable rotting and destruction of cloth and clothing, stating that, unless specially preserved, cloths, like human bodies, eventually disintegrate and disappear. The survival of complete European garments, apart from clothes preserved in bogs or tombs, dating from before 1550 to 1700, is rare. Hence, the long-established use of period portraits, drawings, and engravings within dress history study. A complex and fascinating subject dealt with by Ribeiro for one over a lifetime of pioneering research and scholarship. She has written extensively on 18th and 19th century dress and has examined with care her, mytholo her, mytholo her methodologies. Aware of the view put forward, for example, by Oslander, that objects that are not just seen but also felt and touched, thereby distinguishing between visual and material culture. Ribeiro offers in her recent book Fashion and Fiction, Dress in Art and Literature in Stuart, England, a masterly account of 17th century dress through, yet again, a skillful interdisciplinary fusion of analysis and period portraiture, rare surviving fabrics and garments, and text drawn from period novels and other text. Use of literature in dress history research. Ribeiro's emphasis on the use of fiction as a source for the study of fashion dress history is an indication that this source is now accepted in the field as a means of breathing life, emotion, and movement in, into our study of historical clothing. Miller has stressed that the sensual and aesthetic uh, what cloth feels and looks like is the source of its capacity to objectify myth, cosmology, and also morality, power, and value. Yeah, yet... How can this be extracted from static cloth on frozen mannequins in dimly lit galleries or stored in boxes? The, the use of novels, diaries and travellers' tales has become one answer and is now an established tool for injecting movement into dress history. In the 80s, both Buck and Roach drew ex insightful ideas from period novels. Roach noted that descriptions of the clothing of characters in late 18th century French novels helped clarify period uh, social hierarchies and that novelists' account, accounts of clothing of women in the 17th, 1770s evoked dissolute seduction, sexual display and the dangers of city life for virtuous girls but also drove home the importance of social masks since the fascination of clothes, fa fashion, and the circulation of objects promoted the confusion of ranks. Hughes has further emphasised that clothes in fiction are clothes in action, clothes experienced and clothes observed, dressed in fiction. Clothes of the past are warmed into life. Travellers' tales also carry precious historical descriptions of all kinds of clothing, from those of royalty to the poverty-stricken, all of which have to read. Uh, with extreme care, with an eye on the viewpoint of the traveller. Cable and fr uh, fr uh, 
Cable and French Christian missionaries traveling remote Buddhist Mongolia, China, were deeply impressed by the richness of dress of a Kalmuk princess uh, from the uh, Altai Mountains in the 1920s. Uh, well, and provide us today with a detailed account of her appearance, both in text and visually. They photographed her, uh, noting that her hair hung down in two long, glistening plaits, outlining the pure oval of her face, and was, ga- was, ga- was gathered into jeweled sheaths, forming part of her regal headdress, jade, gold and silver ornaments covered her breast, and a satin garment of somber richness fell from her shoulders to her feet. Travellers' tales, however, are often rigid in imperialism, colonialism, right or left-wing politics, gendered prejudice or sentimentality, and can also offer far less neutral views. In 1938, uh, Sitwell published an account of his journey around Romania, where he enjoyed the hospitality of aristocratic circles and villages alike. However, the anti-Semitism embedded in his comments about the Jews of Hotin, a small port Jewish town in Romanian Galicia, is clear. It is the tattered, greasy caftans of the Jews uh, to which the greatest horror attaches. The Jews of small towns like Hotin are upon a lower scale of life, physically than any other slum population in the world. Uh, As Taylor notes, Sitwell then endorsed the proposal made that year of Stretcher, the Nazi uh, court leader of Franconia, that Romanian Jews should be settled in Madagascar. And then there's a figure here of that Kalmuk princess in Chinese Mongolia, 1925. Mm. Uh, Oral history and the oral testimony as a source for dress history and fashion studies. Oral history and testimony form another still underused (laughs) uh, but now established tool in dress history and fashion studies. Again, such work needs always to be set in its related interdisciplinary context of social, cultural and dress history. The preciousness of this method is that it brings the interviewer close to the personal aspect of clothing uh, through memories, uh, yes, um, uh, most especially those of people once marginalised from big history. This process requires sensitivity to the interviewee, uh, patience over transcription, and open-mindedness as the results uh, may be entirely unexpected. Perks and Thompson's oral history reader demonstrates the scope of research with its texts on lesbian history, women's role in the Ku Klux Klan, World War II memories, and so on. Reader too believes in the power of testimony and the importance of those who are historically invisible, having a public voice that adds a deeper human understanding to the historical record. Use of photography and film in dress history studies. There is now a whole academic industry of film fashion studies uh, with its own academic journals, including film, fashion, and consumption. My personal interest lies in documentary and amateur film and photography. If novels and travelers' tales offer some injection of spirit into the field of dress history, documentary, amateur film, and photographs offer even more. Again, these sources are used by researchers because they offer images of those who might otherwise be left out of dress history, such as Edith Tudor Hart's documentary uh, photograph of a poor but cheery London woman. Uh, Yes, there's a photo. Unknown woman on the cross channel ferry in tweed coat. And cap. Okay. Uh, images taken in action rather than posed formally in a photograph photographer's studio. Again, offer missing information on clothing in movement. Uh, in 1903, the punch political cartoonist Sam Bourne, father of 
Messel, Lord Messel, uh, a keen ex- experimental street photographer, travelled in a gale on the Cross Channel ferry. Sanborn photographed a woman traveller struggling against uh, the wind wrapped uh, in a body concealing, a masculine styled, heavy tweed coat uh, with her tweed cap uh, rammed inelegantly over her forehead. Uh, this snatched image of dress in action is a far cry from the pose, static elegance uh, of the decorative, feminized outdoor clothing choices seen in the studio photograph of Sanborn's daughter in about 1907. In it, Maud has carefully arranged both her large hat with its huge silk bow and a swanstone stole in their precise and fashionably correct positions before permitting the studio photographer in Oxford to take the photo. Uh, the sense of movement to be found in documentary and amateur film also offers useful evidence of clothing in movement. Among the short documentary films made by uh, Mitchell and Kenyon uh, is one taken as workers leave the, the Alfred Butterworth Cotton Mill in Hollandwood, uh, Lancashire. This shows in detail women and girls in clogs wrapping their heavy shawls around their bodies uh, with no sign yet of the consumption of the more fashionable ready-made jackets already available as daily outerwear. Uh, Eck and Kaufman uh, using the resources of Screen Archives Southeast at the University of Brighton, uh, set out to reveal the research value of amateur film for fashion history. Using themes of sport, leisure, work and travel related to the 1920s and 30s fashions, uh, they matched garments filmed at public and family events to dress surviving in local museums in the south of England. Uh, this fascinating interdisciplinary research tour de force uh, reveals interwar dress both in movement and in its uh, provenance consumption context. Eck and Koofman identify the settings as mostly middle class, confirming aptly that these films show everyday dress in its context rather than separated from it, uh, allowing us to read clothes not just as a static image but with an added associations of body shape, gesture, and mannerisms, business and fashion history. Business history has also finally become a growing field within dress and textile studies. Today's accounts recognize the power of consumer choice and style at change as major driving forces in business, past and present. Psychus, for example, has shown how these have impacted on business success uh, within the English cotton print trade in the 19th century. Uh, Through examination of 900 print sample books, he clarified the complex annual business export cycle of printed cottons, noting the fashion-driven seasonality of related design. Uh, yes, um, the business historian uh, Blazik um, has made a seminal contribution to this field through her edited book, Producing Fashion, Commerce, Culture and Consumers, uh, as has Godley through his business history research, such as the development of the clothing industry, technology and fashion. The business history of Dior's haute couture uh, fan salon has finally also been examined, revealing the salon to be very much uh, more than the most glamorous leading to house in post-war Paris, as depicted in most fashion history accounts. Examining its huge financial success, uh, Palmer emphasizes Dior's direct energetic involvement in the business success of the company. Uh, she clarifies for the first time that by 1953, having opened only in 1947, the House of Dior impressively grossed more than $7 million a year and was by far the most profitable couture company ever created, with its couture exports accounting for more than half the total of the Paris couture export market by 1957 and with flourishing related companies across five continents 
<coughs> uh, dress and collecting. We learn our dress history and build images of the appearance of our past in no small part from displays of historic dress in local and national museums. Today, because of the extraordinary popular fascination with fashion, especially that related to designers and women celebrities, glamorous fashion exhibitions have become a financial and pub publicity prop for museums all over the world, even at the expense of, of other more historically based displays. This in turn has generated much debate at fashion studies conferences including critical reviews of fashion exhibitions and in-depth analysis of display motivations and theory. The journal Fashion Theory produced a special edition, Exhibitionism, edited by Palmer and Steele, which confronted passionate current exhibition-related debate, uh, noting issues such as the tensions um, in museum displays between scholarship and contemporary fashion styling, and between experimental display and historical artefact, all of which indicate the vibrancy of our field today. Conclusion. <coughs> uh, for me, <coughs> pardon me, for me, the crucial vital processes are touching, looking, listening, and reflecting. Uh, touching first, when allowed, and then looking closely at garments from poor, worn-out clothing to perfect couture, and examining stitching, restitching, patching, cutting, so on. Listening to voices recorded through oral history or voices lying mute in archives is a key element of research. These are thoroughly creative processes. Um, it takes time to research, reflect on, uh, and then interpret objects of clothing in their specific and yet interdisciplinary, historically, historical gendered, class or ethnic context. Uh, this next figure or figure uh, attached image uh, shows a magnificent shawl handwoven in the hills of Kashmir, perhaps in the 1865 to 1870 period. Exported to and worn probably in France or England, it was altered with the highest of tailing, tailoring skills into a fashionable and elegant bustle-backed ladies' coat in about 1885, finally finding itself locked away in the stores of Worthing Museum, brought out for occasional exhibition. Uh, Fred Davis asserts significantly that fashion styles and ideas are the irrepressible of coming, the ir sorry, the irrepressible outcomings of localities, regionalisms, and particularisms of every sort. This unprovenanced coat uh, raises exactly these issues within the history of European Indian cross cultural consumption, colonialism, Euro American fashion, and Orientalism in the 1860 to 1890 period, and in the context of cultures bleeding across Rosaldo's porous boundaries. Uh, through all of this, we need to be alert to our own contemporary cultural and historical assumptions. These are often so deeply embedded in our mind that it is hard to even realize their presence, and they can catch us unawares and lead us to errors in dating garments or a false decoding of their historical, social place, and cultural meaning. Clothes are important. Miller notes that new studies on dress and material culture seek to convey the experiences of peoples where cosmology, that is one's understanding of the nature of the universe and one's place within it, is often formulated through the making, wearing, displaying and destruction of fibres. For me, studying artefacts of surviving dress along the lines of approaches discussed here, uh, uh, brings us very close to the breath of the past. Uh, the possibilities for future research are many. Uh, for example, there is growing interest in examining the design, making, retailing, and consumption of everyday dress across the world, past and present, 
in its specific global and local context. Uh, Hanson, Norris, Clark, and Palmer have triggered new research dealing with the global circulation and local meanings of second-hand and recycled clothing. Analysis of global tourism's cultural, economic, and design impact on textiles and clothing produced in the remotest corners of the world for tourist sale and export is another growing area of interest opened up by Cohen back in 1989 with his article, The Commercialization of Ethnic Crafts. In the blossoming fields of dress history and the fashion study and fashion studies, these themes point to positive and rapidly growing uh, international research developments. Uh, the, hit, the horizons seem limitless, and there is no end to research possibilities in sight, with much still to be done. Okay. Chapter one.